Hello everybody, how's it going? This is Seth Kniep, Kniep in it real. And this is Emily Davchev. Did I say your name correctly this time? You did, good job. Hello everybody, how's it going? Oh, this is sorry, Seth hold on, hold on, hold on. Real. My bad. Let me fix that really quick. Sorry guys, let me just fix that. And boom, got it. Okay, cool, we're good. All right, so what we're gonna do today, guys, can you hear me okay, Emily? Yep. Okay, great. Awesome. Um, guys, for some reason, Instagram is not working. It's not working for me. It's not working for Kimberly. I don't know if it's an Instagram issue or what, but every time I try to go live, it's just, it sits there and says it can't go live. So hopefully we'll figure that out. Let me just try one more time for those of you guys waiting on Instagram. And we're going to jump right in. All right. So guys, we just finished Ecom 2019. And it was... How would you describe it, Emily? It was awesome. It was nonstop, fabulous content. I mean, I literally have never been to a conference before where every single person I heard speak had content. Usually it's like, oh yeah, I got something from that event, but this was just right. <laughs> nonstop, got to recover from it kind of conference. So it was awesome. Guys, it, it really was incredible. People were crying laughing, hugging, people didn't want to go home at the end. I, I mean, the Just Fun Time community is amazing. And I know many of you guys were there and I just want to say it was so cool to meet many of you guys in person and to see people from last year making nothing at Amazon and they come back this year to our event and they're, some of them are now millionaires. Some of them are now doing 20,000 a month, some 30, some 40. Like it's, it's just amazing guys. I just hope it encourages a ton of you guys to get out there and do what you need to do. To make it happen. So, hello everybody. Great to see you guys. For those of you guys who didn't make it, Ecom 2019, it is the most important event of the entire year that you could attend for learning how to build an e-commerce brand. And I can I can say that without shame and without embarrassment. Like truly amazing guys. And Emily was there. She spoke as well. She shared her story. Uh, Brett George was there. Patrick was there. And this one guy walks up to me, Emily. He's like, Seth, look. And he grabs his phone. I'm gonna grab mine by way of illustration. And he goes, Look, Seth, look at this. And he's showing me his numbers 150,000 a month. Oh 150,000 a freaking month. And he learned this from just one dime. That's awesome. Yeah. I know. Another guy walks up. He was doing 30,000 a month last year when he went to the summit. Now he's doing three times that, over 90,000 a month. And not just revenue, guys, revenue with profit, whether it's 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 percent. So I just, I hope this encourages you guys. You can do this. You can make it happen. Okay, well, we're going <laughs> to jump right in. Um, and in a minute, you guys, I will tell you why I have 1,000 dimes with me. I'll share that in a second. Again, for those of you guys who follow us on Instagram, Instagram is truly currently not working. I don't know why. It just won't go live. It won't go for me or anyone else in my family. So we're doing this here. But we're going to start with this question, and it's super important. Emily, can you tell us how do you build a brand on Amazon? Walk us through what that looks like, and then I'll speak to it for a little bit. And then, guys, we're going to go straight to your questions over here. Sure. Um, so this is a multifaceted question, but I think there's a couple really, really crucial things that jump out to me to start with. First of all, we need to know who we're talking to with our products. I think gone are the days where you could just shop for something, throw it up on Amazon, and the demand uh, was there and nobody had met it yet. Um, when I scan Amazon, I don't see any majorly obvious consumer products that are missing at this point. So that means that we really have to go into it with um, more of an inventor mindset. There's tons of problems to be solved, but they need to be solved in ways that people are looking for the problem to be solved, but in a newer and novel way. And um, so as we know, Amazon is moving in the direction of helping us protect our brands. And they're really getting behind those of us that aren't just trying to sell products, we're trying to really establish a brand. So the first thing is you need to be brand focused. This isn't a one-off product, this is you. And even if it's just one product in a product line, that's okay. But this is you, your company, um, representing the world. This isn't you as a seller, this is you as a business owner. When you think of yourself as a business owner instead of a seller, literally everything changes because you would never try to bring a product to the market on your own website or sell it in a big box store or anything else without knowing who it was for and what you intended it to do and all of that. That would be silly almost to think that you would do that. 
But on Amazon, a lot of us, including myself, have gotten distracted by the platform so that we're, we're so focused on selling a product that we forget, no, we're actually trying to run a business. And so something I shared during the conference, and it's kind of something I keep preaching to everyone who will listen to me say it is know your target market. And this is not some cliche business thing that, cause I know everyone likes to throw target market around, but this is really crucial because when you write your copy, it's not just for anyone who buys XYZ. You need to know who those people are, what they appreciate and what they value. And um, a couple people have asked me like, okay, I totally agree with you. Yeah, we need to know who these people are, but we can't get that kind of customer data through Amazon. So I'm kind of blind to this, right? And yes, you are in the sense of Amazon because they're not gonna share that with us full disclosure, but we're not blind to it in the sense of the market as a whole. And that's where I really encourage people to do things like um, establish a focus group or hire a company that can put a focus group together for you or buy a marketing report or create your own if you're good at research. The same way you would do if you were trying to establish demand off of Amazon. Um, and so there's a lot of things and a lot of people think, well, I, that's probably super expensive. I don't have the money for that. In my opinion, we can't afford not to do that because we're not going to, I, most of us are not going to get lucky enough to just be successful and everyone that wants it just comes and purchases from us. And if you want to spend less on PPC and have high conversion rates and have all the things work for you that you want to have work, you need to have this data handy before, in my opinion, before you even create your listing or finalize that first purchase order from your supplier. Real so quick, those, yeah. I'm gonna jump in real quick, Emily, because this is yep. so good. Yep. When I started on Amazon, I was a great example of someone who didn't think about building brands. So when I started on Amazon, I was just thinking, I need to generate income so I can leave my nine to five, which is crushing my soul, so I can actually have margin with my family. And so what I did is I just started selling stuff. And it was good, Like I learned a lot from it. That's great for a short-term game if you're trying to generate cash quickly. If you're a reseller, in fact, I learned something super interesting from Amazon at this event, guys. Amazon came to our event, four of them, as someone very high up, then someone representing brand registry, transparency, as well as Amazon Project Zero, which was released in under a week ago. Um, it was amazing. And, and one of the things they talked about is they do support resellers. And under reseller, here's all the categories they have. They have arbitrage. They have wholesale and they have drop ship. All of those are 100% supported by Amazon. But what Emily's talking about is a little different. And there's a reason for it because the long-term gains are so much greater. In fact, for those of you guys who got the email sent out this morning, I said less busy work and it's true. When you have a brand that's selling for you, there's less time you have to spend, you know, finding the next product to resell, to resell. And you're spending more time on creating a brand people trust. So when you said this, Emily, and, and I really like it, you said, I'm not just selling on Amazon, I'm a business owner. It's not me and my products. products and how the world looks at that, how the people see that. Like it's a different perspective. One of the things I mentioned in one of the, the talks at Ecom 2019, Build your brand and your product as if there was no Amazon at all. Like what would it take for your product to succeed on your own e-commerce website completely independent of Amazon? Build that. And if that's excellent and it's so well done that it builds a brand of value, then if you do launch an Amazon, you're going to be that much more successful because there's already so much trust for the platform. Yeah, fantastic advice. I think that's really great. And I think reframing it is way more than just terminology to say I'm a business owner. And I kind of disagree with this thing, like everybody can be an entrepreneur. In theory, that's true, but not everyone can be everything in this world. We need to find things that we're good at. And you can be good at this. Anyone can be good at this with hard work. It's just that we have to go into it thinking like a business owner, that encompasses a lot of responsibilities. That's not just managing a one you know, one seller central product listing kind of thing. That's a lot of things to be successful. So I think you're, you're spot on exactly. We've got to think like we're building it off of Amazon, whether we do or not, we should, but whether we do or not, we should be thinking that way. So I think you're totally right. Is there anything you would add, Emily, about, because I know you talk a lot about this and I, and I you love this question. It's, um, who am I talking to? 
Yeah. And, and you know, what's funny is Emily and I, we have these conversations about like, okay, for the next video, what would really help people a lot? How, we always like to introduce it to you guys with a super helpful concept. And just to remind you guys, Emily is a very successful Amazon seller. This isn't theory. This isn't something she just, I taught her and she's now telling you. Yes, I've taught her stuff, but she's applying what she's learning from Just One Dime. She is succeeding. She's learning and she's making income on, and she's growing that and testing that and failing her way into success. So I want you to know every time I bring someone on, it's someone who is doing it. There are no theorists. There's no room for theorists at Just One Dime. Um, we have literally fired people who wanted to be coaches, but they wouldn't show us their sales. They have to show their sales. We have to know the profitable. So I just want you guys to know that's extremely important and top notch. So back to the question. Emily likes to ask this question. Mm -hmm. Who are you talking to? Can you elaborate on that and explain why that's such an important question that everyone here should be asking when they launch their brand? Yeah, absolutely. So like I shared during my presentation at Ecom 2019, right before I started selling on Amazon, I had invented a product. And just to give you a quick synopsis, it was this cooler bag. And it was for anybody from a kid's lunch to a diabetic's insulin. And if you had asked me about it, I could have talked you to you for like an hour on the benefits, the technology, the IP strategy. I mean, I, I owned it. You know, I knew this product intimately because I had built it and I built it because I found research that said, hey, if this stuff goes bad, it's really dangerous for the kid or for the diabetic or whatever. So I built it with somebody in mind and with a problem in mind. So I knew exactly who I was talking to and who would appreciate that and then how I would design the actual product to speak to them as well. I wouldn't have cartoon characters on my diabetic insulin bag probably, you know? So it, it, that sounds silly to say, but when you're doing it for Amazon, it's easy to get distracted. And like, even though when I built the product that I sell now, I did a lot of the same principles, I still kind of like took the edges off of it a little bit because I was so busy learning PPC and getting distracted by all that noise that says, oh, just find a product, find a product. So I found a pain point and I knew my customer, but my copy is kind of good for the general mass. You know, it's kind of compelling, but I don't know that it speaks to a woman that's 34 that lives in Iowa and on and on. You know, I don't know the real demographics. And so one of the things I said in my presentation is just like feel the dreams, Kevin Costner. You can't build it and they will come. And even though I know that, I mean, that's been so hammered home for me for so long, I still fell prey to that, even though I didn't intend to. So when I launched my second product, I'm, I could talk your ear off again because I know it intimately. And that's the difference between who you're talking to and who you assume you're talking to. And I hope, we'll see, but I hope that it's less painful second time around for PPC and conversion rates and photos and all the stuff because it will be so painfully obvious to me and to my customer. Here's a question that I would love to get your thoughts on, Emily. So you talked about understanding the demographics of your customer. So when you were studying to launch that product and you realized, I gotta know my customer, where do you recommend people go to get those demographics? Do they need to go to an official report and pay a subscription? Do they need to drop into Facebook groups, more of a guerrilla warfare organic method? Where do you recommend they go to figure that out? What, what places? I would say all the, the above. I really like research, but not for the sake of research. Uh, and I really go into all of those. I go into Facebook groups. I love using Pinterest because I feel like you can get a really good feel for content creation. And then you can just look at even the followings. If a million people have seen an article about how to clean your home better, that's a really interesting piece of information. And they're sharing it all over the place. It shows a lot of interest. And then you can drill down farther with actual marketing reports. Um, but I think one of the most useful things is focus groups, because if you can get 12 people in a room who don't know you and don't know your product, and you essentially ask them, please be as harsh as necessary to give me feedback on this product concept or prototype or whatever it is, you can get a lot of information and you can assemble that focus group to be your assumed target market once you have that research. And if you find, hey, it's not resonating with the 30 to 40 year olds, I thought it would be great feedback and all you did was pay for a focus group. You didn't buy you know, five grand of product from China before you learned this. So I would say anything from guerrilla marketing to official marketing to paying someone to assemble a focus group, all of the above. As much as you might think you're throwing money at something you don't need to, I would argue you shouldn't move forward until you know that stuff. 
This is so good. And I have such a cool story to share with you, Emily, and everyone here that backs exactly what Emily said. Right out during before we come 2019, let me go back further. Almost every day someone sends me an email and they say, Seth, I would love to partner with you. I would love to be personally coached by you. I would love, you know, whatever, just all this different stuff. And I get kind of numb to it after a while because everyone has an opportunity. And if I respond to all those emails, that's all I would do. I would no longer have time for my family or anything. And so what I did is this guy caught my attention because it sounded like he was really legit. So I said, I tell you what, I said, come to Ecom 2019 because he's already in Los Angeles. Approach me and talk to me. It was sort of my way of, no, it really was my way of testing him. I want to know if this guy's serious. So he did. So he paid for the ticket. He showed up. I didn't know what he'd look like, but he approached me. He found me and said, Seth, I'm the guy who emailed you and you said, get a ticket and be there and talk to me. And my response was, perfect. So you're here. That's awesome. He shows up, we began talking, and the more he talked, the more interested I became. We do a lot of clothing products on Amazon. He is actually a clothing manufacturer in Los Angeles. So not just for Los Angeles, but their clothing ends up in Forever 21, Nordstrom's, stuff like that no one wants what ended up in Ross, the non-branded. Some of their stuff ends up in TJ Maxx, and they have a sewing factory in Vietnam. They have a factory, not one that they own, but that they contract to in China. And he said, look, I will take you to my offices and show you everything. And I have a very good uh, BS detector because a lot of people try to BS me because they want money, they want an opportunity, but they don't want the cost that comes with it. And so what I did is I said, look, if you are serious about this, you got to convince me right now. He's like, well, I believe the clothing industry. This is like, you know, a $30 million opportunity. I said, no, it's like probably over a hundred million. He's like, okay. He said, well, here's what I want to do. And here's what the two owners of the company wanted to start explaining. I became convinced. He said, look, I will drive you there. You don't have to pay for the Uber. I'll take you to dinner. Just can I please show you this place? So I said, I'll, I'll do it with one condition. We have to be rolling cameras the entire time because everything I learned, I like to share with my audience. If you want me to leave the company name out of it, I respect that. I'll do it. But I want them to be able to learn. Now, those of you guys who follow me on Instagram, you probably saw me on, <clears throat> I think it was Monday standing outside their manufacturing warehouse talking with this guy and in all respect have you guys seen uh despicable me anybody i told him this and he's cool with it. he looks like Gru. okay so think Gru, seth and Gru on a business venture <laughs> even in the car i said dude this is not sound ridiculous but because i love despicable me the movie the, the pixar film you look like Gru. that helped build the trust a little bit he just started laughing it was so funny <laughs> so anyway seth and Gru, i'll call him Gru. <clears throat> along with my business partner, Josiah, <clears throat> excuse me, and our film team, went all the way to his office in California, Los Southern California, and they took me through the entire process of how they decide what fashions, you're going to love this, Emily, what fashions, what clothing is a hit and what isn't. I mean, they walk, I learned more about clothing in th three Stack entrepreneur guys, if you give value, you get opportunities that are just out the gazoo. And I want you guys to listen to what I'm about to tell you, because even though you may not be in the fashion industry, you can transfer these concepts over to any product, exactly what Emily's talking about. Here's how they do it, because I wanted to know. I think everybody is looking for a one-stop shop. Here's where I go, here's a website, and I find everything I need to know about my customers. And the truth is, it doesn't work like that. You have it's, it's messy, and here's the process they go through. Step number one, they go to fashion shows in New York. So they're always seeing what is coming through on the fashion show. Who's walking the walk and, and going down that, that long red carpet and who is it? Who is this model? What is, the, what is the design that's coming out? And what they told me is so interesting and I've known this and Kimberly's been telling me this for years. Fashion has a cycle. So it'll start and it'll come back again. Like bell bottoms in the 70s, boom, they start coming back. You know, the the perm hair look for women in the 80s, boom, it starts coming back. Like these, they cycle, right? First, they go to fashion shows. Second, they go to focus groups, what you just mentioned, Emily. Third, and this isn't in order of priority, they also go to other locations like Forever 21 will approach them and sit down and say, look, here's based on our study, here are all the designs we're interested in, can you do this one for me? So they're actually learning from the companies that are selling direct to consumer. The process, you guys, is astounding. Now, check this out. What I'm about to share with you is like, you won't learn this in school, okay? 
This company has been around for 30 years. They are doing 18 million to 20 million a year. They own another company and a factory in Vietnam and they work with China. And here's the process. First, they figure out what the fashion is. It goes up in a book and this book are a bunch of pages. You can churn it all these different designs or patterns. Once they decide the pattern that they want based on what they're learning, they go to the computer and they literally have artists by hand draw the rose or draw the flower and put that into the computer. They literally hand draw it. They have copyrights on everything. Just to give you perspective, they sued uh, Donald Trump's wife and won. They sued H&M and won. And these companies, these people were stealing their designs. So they sued them for it and they won. And I can tell you, I walked into their office in the back room and I saw all the clothing that was being copied. Think about it. Like I could see it right there and boom, they would show me, look, this was the H&M, this is ours. Look, can you see the difference? I'm like, no, like, oh, look closer, Seth. And boom, like, no, you're right. It's the same design. So first they get, they find out what people, what's interesting to the public, what, what I just told you guys. Then they design it by hand. Then they put it into a computer. Then they print that on a piece of paper. They take the piece of paper, they put it on a board and they cut it out. So they get the cut. So there's two sides. There's the print. There you go. And then there's the cut, like the shape. Okay. Do you want a slim? Do you want a wide? Do you want a tall? What's the girth? All that stuff from the underarm down here. You know, the length of the sleeves. I got very long arms. So that'd be a very strange cut for me. And then they take that and they put it on a mannequin in paper. They test it and they have different mannequins that represent different body shapes and styles around the world. It's, it's amazing, even based on someone's own eth ethnicity, because different ethnicities sometimes have different body shapes. Then they take that and they print that on actual fabric and they do the cutting and they send it to the place in Vietnam to do the sewing. And from there, they ship it to their, their clients. So the reason I'm sharing this with you guys, even if it's not directly relevant to what you are selling, think about the process they go through, how incremental, how step-by-step, -step, how detailed it is in order to get a product that by the time the customer buys it, they already know that customer will love it. They already know because they did the research in advance. If you want to build a brand, guys, you have to do the research in advance. And let me just on the side say this briefly. If you are not a member of Just One Dime, we teach seven product research methods, not one, not two, not it's you and Jungle Scout or you and Amaze Out, seven different methods. And we will continue to add more techniques as we learn more. Like everything I learned for just now that I share with you, I'm going to go so much more in depth with our own warriors. I will turn into more training based on what we are learning as we go. I hope that's really helpful to you guys. And I hope that gives you perspective. You are a business owner. You are not an individual selling Amazon. You are a freaking business owner. Okay. Emily, is there anything you want to add to that before guys, we jump straight into questions and I will tell you guys about what on earth Seth has a thousand dimes sitting on his desk for you guys. These, these are heavy and I promise I'll explain them to you in a minute. Just one quick thing that just supports exactly what you were just saying. You just described a really long process of cutting on paper and trying and mannequins and all this stuff. And I've coached two type of people already with just one dime. The, somebody that says, all I need to do is find my product. Well, yes, factually that's true. But that sounds like we're rushing towards launch. We're not. Think of the process you just described. That's going to take a while. It's going to take time, money, expertise, research, feedback. And then when it gets there, they know that a customer wants it because they put all that time in. Yeah. So, and then I've met with people that are like, oh no, I'm going to take my time with this. The money is in the find and the process, not in the launch part of this. That will come when I perfect this. So don't rush towards launch, be the research, find, focus seller. And then you just apply the steps just one dime teaches and then it's golden. You're, you're good to go. You know you're going to be successful. Yeah. And I want to encourage you guys, especially Grace, because she says, guys, I could use encouragement right now. Let me just encourage you with this. I know it's easy to feel like, man, Seth, he's way up here. And Emily, she's way up there. And these guys are just so successful. It's so easy. We started with zero sales on Amazon. I started with one of these dimes, not literally this one. <laughs> I just got this from the bacon here in, in Los Angeles. But we started with little, you guys, with so little. And we had to build it from there. So I just want to encourage you. We are in the trenches with you. We're doing this daily with you. I know it is not easy. 
but it's not complicated either. This is not some advanced science. It's a matter of what Emily said. If you really break it down, what are you really doing? You're adding value to people's lives. And if you add value to their lives in a way that's meaningful to them, so when they receive the product, they're like, man, I love this. I mean, just to give you an example, Entrepreneur was there speaking. This guy started his company when he was 19 or 18. I forget which now, but he was 19. He was a teenager. I know that. He and his business partner. For two years, they were in litigation. Two years over the word entrepreneur without vowels except for the E at the beginning. And they kept going. And now they've interviewed people like Damon John. I mean, people way high up who've done a lot of business stuff. He talked about this company. And ironically, Emily, it's sitting here on my desk, Anchor. I it's remember. Yeah. Remember this? This was this company was started by a guy who just had a dream and he decided to build value and he builds amazing electronic products. I love Anchor. You know, I love it because my son Josiah, my business partner, he researches the heck out of stuff. He finds the best of the best. When he saw the reviews, when he saw the product, he bought it, he used it, he loved it. Now I'm sold. I'm an Anchor fan. They thought about me before they ever knew me. My question is, are you doing that for your future customers? Okay, let's take some questions. Um, good to see everybody here. Yes, just when I'm ecom 2019 was absolutely amazing, guys. I, I just I, I don't know how to explain it. Like it, I felt so freaking on fire after that event and so motivated to keep going. Like it just it, it's it's amazing when you get to be around people who are grateful and on fire and want to help people. Okay, so let's see. Yeah, I, Amelia, I, there's something up with IG. I don't know what it is. I hope I can find out, but it's like the account is. They didn't shut me down or something. It'd be horrible. I've been nothing illegal. Or I, I've never bought a single follower in my life. A lot of our competitors do. You just go to Social Blade. They go from like 10 followers to 20,000 in a day. We don't do that. Every single follower is a real human being. Unless, I don't know, I can't verify. Maybe they're aliens, but at least they're aliens who <laughs> volitionally chose to follow us. Okay. Um, Instagram and Facebook are not working. Okay. So it's probably a Facebook thing then, guys. Maybe they're temporarily down. Okay. Here's our first question. Guys, you have some great questions. I'm going to try to get to all of them today. And Emily, just jump in as you want to. Ariane says, how do you keep your A costs low? Second, what is the best launch strategy in 2019 avoiding giveaways? I like how you added that. Although I only agree with it 50% and I'll explain why. And he says, I need both of your opinions. <laughs> so I'll start and then you jump in, Emily. So a cost is, let me explain first of all what it is. It means advertising cost of sale. If I am selling a battery pack, this is not mine. If I'm selling a battery pack and I'm advertising it and the keyword bid is around $2 and 50 cents and I have to spend, you know, uh, let's say $20 to sell this for 30, then my a cost is very, very bad. It's very, very high. In other words, I want to spend as little as possible in advertising to sell. So it's basically the percentage of my sales that had to go into advertising costs. In other words, what I spent in advertising divided by the total revenue will give you that percentage. That is your A costs. The way you keep it low is you begin by making it high. You launch, you bid high on all your most important keywords. As a general rule of thumb, you're going to take your one and two word keywords Listen close for your exact match. Now, most likely you won't have any one word keywords. And if you do, be very, very careful because if I just said, I, I can't even think of a single word because this is a battery pack. Okay, let's just say, let's use a different example. Let's say you're selling a coffee mug. If you just said mug, the chances of them searching for your what kind of mug? Coffee. What color mug? Green. Does it have graphics? Yeah, it's funny coffee mugs for men. Oh my goodness, like their chances of buying yours is very slim. So it's very expensive. So be careful with that. But if you do have a one word keyword that very clearly identifies that product, you're going to put it in its exact match. And you're going to bid aggressively higher than the highest bid. Now, there's not an exact science to this, my friends. This is strategical, not analytical. This is why I do not believe in software that works with PPC. For every company out there that says you do this, I, I, I reject it. I think, I think it's Bull crap. And I'm not trying to be disrespectful. I really do. Because there's certain things software cannot tell you that the human brain can do. And I'll explain. Plus, you're limiting yourself. You're taking yourself out of the game. You're not going to understand it well, which means you're probably going to lose a lot more money than you could have gained. For all three word keywords, I recommend you put them in as phrase match. And for all four word or higher keywords, I recommend you put them in as broad match. 
the more keywords you have, the less strict you can be on the match type. Because if my long tail keyword is black 12 volt battery pack for this battery pack, that's a very long tail keyword. And I put that in as a broad match. It's very unlikely that someone will type in something irrelevant to this and this pop up and they click on it and I waste my money. But if I took that long of a keyword and put it in as exact match, it's very likely someone's going to type in something different than this a little bit, but they're still looking for this and I'll never show. And when I do show, it's more expensive because exact match costs more usually than broad match. So if you want a tier, that's my favorite tier currently. Now, two months from now, is that going to change? Yes, because I constantly adjust as I learn what's working for me. But that's your first beginning for your ACoS. After you launch, you're going to wait 10 days minimum. You're going to download your keyword report and you're going to do some analyzation. And this is where software can't help you. You're going to look at your keywords. You're going to say, hmm, I noticed when people type in black 12 volt battery pack that a 40% of the people who type that in and click on my listing buy. In other words, it's a very high converting keyword which means, wow, maybe I should keep bidding on this one a lot. So you wait a month and you're still bidding on it and you're still aggressive and you realize your ACoS is still like 45% and it's removed your profit margin for that keyword. So what you do is you go back into your keyword report, you look at the actual cost per click, then you drop it down to that or just above it. Now, not always, but most often, you'll still get very close to the same number of sales but you're only bidding what was necessary to bid to get this. Now you're ignoring the low, the medium, the highest, and you're bringing it down to what it actually is. And you're using that. And if it starts to slow your sales, you might bring it up a little bit. That's just one of many strategies for reducing your A costs. One more thought, and then Emily, feel free to jump in. Use your PPC keyword report to give you data. Remember Emily talked about this earlier, everyone? She said, make sure you understand your customer, make sure you know who you're talking to. Well, your PPC is real live data. In other words, if you notice people tend to buy it more often every time they search 12 volt, but your main picture doesn't say 12 volt on it. I mean, even let's just say you don't even add it as typographics on the picture, which you're not supposed to do, but currently Amazon doesn't even slap you on the wrist for. I take that back. At Ecom, Emily, I heard someone that did happen to. It's my first time. So apparently, even if you add graphics to your main picture, they could slap you on the wrist for it. So my picture, if it says 12 volt on the actual physical product, that's fine. That's different than adding it on through Photoshop so it's like a watermark. I want to make sure my main picture clearly has 12 volt in the main picture. Why? Because people are buying it a lot when they type in 12 volt and see my listing. Well, if the first picture clearly says 12 volt, then I've just optimized my listing for better conversion. Does that make sense, you guys? So you're you're making your, you're adjusting your listing to what your customer wants to see, because people buy with their eyes when they buy online. Okay, that's a lot. I'll stop. Emily, what would you add to that? Well, I dream my, a lot today. <laughs> <laughs> my brain went a different direction with this, which is now, kind of back to what I was really talking quick, about. Really quick. That's what I yeah. love about these conversations, guys. Yeah. Emily's going to give you different strategies. That's the beauty of this, you guys. There's not just one way to do it. It's holistic. Go for it, Emily. Yeah, so yours is the, the very practical, hands-on approach. And so from a 30,000 view uh, perspective, I would say make your product so obviously desirable that your product essentially sells itself. Now, are all the things that you were saying, Seth, not true? Yeah, you're going to spend money on PPC up front. It's an investment. You need to be visible but you need to be visible and desirable. And there's a lot of people I talked with at Ecom about, you know, should I do a giveaway? Should I do this? Should I do that? There's a lot of evidence that I've done research-wise that's shown me people who create a product for which there's high demand, but it's a new or novel solution, need to spend a lot less money on the promotional side of it. They can be visible all the time, but they're still not even bleeding money because their conversion rate is so high. And so, yeah, you still might want to do a giveaway. You still might spend a lot on PPC up front, but I, I suspect you will get very efficient very quickly um, rather than, you know, somebody that creates a somewhat me too product. You've really got to carve your place a lot heavier with money and visibility and all these things. 
So um, I think giveaways, they have their place. I personally, for my next product, would like to not go that route at all. I would like to focus exclusively on PPC and have people have high demand for what my product is and have it show up when people are looking for the solution that I've provided. That's my new strategy. And I hope second time around, it'll be a lot more efficient. Very cool. And you make a great point about giveaways. Even Viral Launch, they, they're very wise how they did this. And I watched the transition. Their whole business model was built off of giveaways at the beginning. I don't know if you remember or if you ever worked with them at all, Emily, but the way they ran their software was people can buy your product at a huge discount. And so you do a bunch of giveaways, like 520, whatever, per day for seven to 10 days to two weeks. And it caused you to rank. Well, Amazon's algorithm changed and those don't help you to rank nearly as well. So it became more and more costly. So while that was going down, they started building up the product research tool. I love to see those ninja moves. <laughs> see, they were thinking about you and they were thinking about me. That, that's a good example of, of understanding their customer. But um, Emily, I, I agree with you. The, it, the giveaways aren't as effective. However, I'll add one thing. Amazon has, you can create your own giveaway from within Seller Central. It's under your promotion tab if you have a seller professional account. You can create a giveaway, create coupon codes, and you can run Facebook ads. And we talked about this quite a bit at Ecom, where you run a promotion. And if I see your Facebook ad, it'll take me to a landing page. And I enter in the information or I collect the coupon code from that page after giving you my name and email. So then you're going to send me the coupon code. Then I go to the link and I buy the product. And it helps somewhat, but it's doing it on Amazon's platform instead of on a third party like Viral Launch. And so a lot of people have done this, not as much for getting the BSR to go down or the sales rank to go up, but as a way to get people excited to get that first burst of sales. Then, check this out guys, and Dan Rogers is really good at this. When you receive the product, there's a gift inside and it wasn't one that you promised. So your chance of me leaving your review is so much higher because I saw high perceived value, your, your photos are beautiful. But then I open the product and the real value, what I'm actually going to see and hold and use and touch is really high. And so now I'm extremely motivated to give you a very strong review. Guys, that is so much more effective than doing an incentivized review, asking a family or a friend, been there, done that, worked for a time. I do not recommend you guys do it because Amazon could come along and just completely cut off all review opportunity for your listing if you do. Okay, let's keep going. Next question. Really, really, yes, Dennis, brain focused business owner. That is awesome, brother. And that's exactly how we should be doing it. No problem, OB. I know you're going to be there next year. Um, guys, we planned e 2019 in two months. You know when we're going to start planning for e 2020? Yesterday, we already started. <laughs> so I can't wait. <laughs> okay, Kowal says this. What if my minimum order quantity, MOQ, is 100? In other words, the supplier will only let me buy it if I'm at least purchasing a hundred of them, but, or that's what I can afford, but the supplier's MOQ is a thousand when I add on custom packaging. This is very, very typical Kowal. So I just want to encourage you, this is classic, this is common, this is normal. I can't find a supplier who offers a hundred quantity and custom packaging. Do you have any advice on this one, Emily? Yeah, um, you could go two directions with this. You could offer to pay a higher unit price, which some of them, when I've been um, getting quotes before, some of them are willing to do that, especially if they feel like from the gate, you're very professional and you have a good product and you're acting like a business owner, not a one-off customer. Then a lot of times people are willing to be flexible. And another option you could do, which I know it's, it's not the most efficient, but it does get you around that problem is order the product, send it to yourself or some you know prep center or whatever you want to do, but have custom packaging made stateside or wherever you live and combine the two until your MOQ gets to the place where they're happy to do it for you. I know it's less efficient, but it is a way to kind of stay on budget if you're not you know, prepared to buy a thousand. It's good, it's really good. And here's another idea. You don't have to start with retail packaging. You could go the poly, poly bag route and have a little label like a sticker with the FNSQ on it. And then you might say, well, Seth, how is it going to sell? Because it doesn't look that great. Well, if your photos are amazing and if the product is differentiated in a way beyond the retail packaging, maybe in the color, the material, how it functions, the material is eco-friendly, something like that, then you still, if, if you know that's important to your customer because you studied your customer and you read your competitor's critical reviews, 
then you still could get very decent sales at the beginning until you have enough funds to go back and say, okay, I'm ready for the thousand. In other words, if the success of your product depends on the retail packaging alone, and there are some who've done this well, so I'm not saying it's always out the window, but in most cases, I would say you haven't differentiated well enough. There should be something else. There's gotta be something else, some other value other than, well, I got pretty packaging. Well, what's gonna keep Bobby McGee from doing the same thing? He's watching. <laughs> He's always watching. <laughs> All right, let's see the next question. Great question, by the way, Koal. Thank you so much for asking that. All right, let me see. Okay, uh, Luzine, how are you? Luzine Sarkisian Gazellian. That is one amazing name, Gazellian. It's like a gazelle, that's awesome. Hi, I've tried a maze out to search for products, but after long research, I found that the BSR, the best sellers ranking, I got from there was different from the Amazon product main page. What do you think happened? Thanks. Great question, Luzine. Very simple, you need to go to Amazow, and there's a little button on the right side, once you track the product, click update. It'll refresh the page, and it'll pull in the latest data. BSR is like this constantly. It's not gonna stay the same. It's up and down and up, and what's important is that you understand the BSR history over a period of time. In fact, once you've tracked the product based on a keyword, like let's just say, to use this example, you put in 12 volt black battery pack, you tracked it, and all the competitors come up, Click on competitors and lists in the upper right corner. Go there. You're going to see a list. Take out all the irrelevant competitors. Now you just have, let's just say there's 10 that are similar to the product you want to sell. Click on the title of any of those. And that will take you to a page of graphs. And those graphs will actually show you the history of the BSR. You could do the same thing with Keepa, which is automatically integrated into the Amazon listing through an extension on the browser of the Amazon page. This is really important. You don't want to just look at the BSR for today. You want to see its history. Let me give you an example. You could start searching and say, Seth, I want to do 12 volt black battery packs. By the way, I have no idea if this is 12 volt or not. So anyways, I want to do these two. And you go look at your competitors and you're like, man, three of these guys are selling 77 of them a day. Well, if you go to Amazow or Keepa, you might be surprised. Wait a minute. For the last week, they've been selling 77 a day. But before that, they were selling 12 a day for the last six months. How in the world is that possible? They're probably doing some kind of promotion at a discounted rate. They could be doing an Amazon giveaway. They could be running Facebook ads. They could have a coupon on the listing itself. Like there's all these different reasons those sales may not reflect the market, but a promotion. That's why it's important you see the history over a period of time. It's just like in statistics, the bigger the sample you get, the more accurate your data is going to be. If I interview 100 people and say, what do you think of, who is that politician running and she wants to break Amazon and all these huge jet and Walmart into a bunch of different little categories, which and I, I rarely get political, but that one really got my attention. It's so anti-entrepreneurship. Like, oh, I didn't hear that. I will never vote for this person. <laughs> <laughs> no. Yes. Anyways, some politician who apparently she's going to run for president or something and I forget her name. You guys probably know who she is. But anyways, what was I saying? Oh, if I interviewed 100 people and say, what do you think of her? And 40 of them say, I like her. And 60 say they don't. That's not a very good sample. But if I interview 10,000 people, okay, that's a more realistic sample that may represent the populace. You want to do the same thing with Amazow, the same thing with product research. You need a large sample of data. That's why you need patience and aggression. I know they feel like they're at war, but you need both, my friends. Be patient. Be aggressive. Don't be timid, but don't be in a hurry. Like Treebeard said, don't be hasty because it could cause you to lose money. Okay. Chris, how are you, my friend? Good to see you. Chris Sinopoli. How am I doing the pronunci pronunciation of these names, everybody? I love I think you. you're super brave to try. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I would be so brave. <laughs> Nobody tells me I really don't care much what people think. <laughs> Sometimes it doesn't work out well for me. Um, okay. Chris Sinopoli. Sounds like Monopoly. Okay, I'll stop. <laughs> Chris, can I launch more than one product at a time when first starting? Or can I launch three at once? Pros, cons? Emily, I'm just going to give this one to you at the beginning. I want to see what you think. Since I know you've been in this mindset with the next product you want to launch. Yeah, so you you definitely can 
would I say yes to the average person? No, I wouldn't. And here's why cash flow. It's great to think of it as a diverse part portfolio right from the start and as a good strategy, but you're going to find, I, I suspect if you're like me and like a lot of people I've talked to, you're going to find that um, it takes a lot more money than you think with advertising investment and all these things that come up along the way. And I think launching three products in the same vicinity is a great plan for cash flow, especially like Seth has taught us to have a quick moving product, a medium, and then a slower. And each of those has different margins. The quick moving is usually small and the highest um, priced item usually has a much larger item but doesn't turn over as frequently. That kind of diverse portfolio is good in the long run. Unless you're well-versed in business and PPC and product selection and negotiations and all these things, then I would say put a pause on that, focus on making one product great, and once you've done that and proven to yourself that you can do it and proven in the marketplace that you can do that, then launch your second. I agree. I can't add a thing to that. Over time, as you have more capital and experience, you can launch three. But she's 100% correct. In the beginning stages, launch one. Do your research well. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, I'm going to take a quick break to tell you guys what these are for. This is just for fun, and then we'll go back to the questions. By the way, Emily, thank you for being here. Someone on here said, why is she fake? Um, okay, I have a confession to make. Emily's a robot. You're right. <laughs> this, this, she's complete, and I have a remote control over here, and she's just completely <laughs> a robot. And she's not real. This is actually a hologram robot. <laughs> so it's a hologram of a robot. <laughs> what so, would you like me to say next? <laughs> <laughs> so, and that money she's making on Amazon, it's fake. It's just play money. Amazon sends her right. money to her account. And those long nights where she works a graveyard shift because she loves her family all night, it, it's fake. She just does that for fun. It's not real. Yeah. This <laughs> um, is all a hoax. <laughs> I'm like one of the most real people I've ever met. And I know she's real because I met her just a few days ago. And she stood up in front of hundreds of people and gave some of the best strategies on understanding your market I've ever heard. So I can tell you that to you as a fact. And if you still have questions, um, I would love to talk to you in person. <laughs> <laughs> You're brave behind the keyboard. I'll never forget that one time someone started getting really, really critical in our passive income group. And it was just ridiculous. It's just stupid, you know, accusations. I, say, I said, you know what? I have an idea. Hop on video chat with me in front of everyone and let's just have a conversation. And all of a sudden they disappear. Yeah. Yeah, it's so, too real. Yep. Yeah, and I encourage you guys. And I know, guys, I know doubts and questions will come into everyone's mind. They do mine as well. But here's the big thing: when you doubt, the number one person you're doubting is yourself. Because at the end of the day, if em Emily's not a millionaire, is that fair to say, Emily? You're not a absolutely millionaire. Yeah. not even close. But she's doing well. She did. What was your last quarter? Oh, I forget. What was the uh, nearly fifty thousand forty nine and change at forty three percent margin. So almost forty, almost fifty thousand dollars in the last quarter at forty percent profit margin. That's good. That's that's really awesome. Especially since a year ago, were you making any money a year ago? No, no. Yeah. So like in less than a year, that's that's incredible. So she's qualified, guys. But when you start having doubts, there's two things. Number one, you put that blame on someone else because you're really doubting is yourself. And if you start blaming someone else, you're using them as an excuse for your own insecurities. I'm gonna be super real with you guys. People who blame people are people who don't know how to own their shit. I don't use that word often, but I do mean it sincerely. They don't. You have to take ownership. Um, I used to be like that, Emily. Before I started doubling a dime, I didn't own my stuff. You heard me and Kimberly being very vulnerable at Ecom 2019. You asked her, like we shared a lot about our struggles, but. I had to learn to start taking, I literally had to go to therapy for it. So I've been on both sides. So I know you guys, <laughs> I know where you're coming from and I know it's hard. I just wanted you to be real with yourself, guys. Don't blame other people. Second, let's just say I was a billionaire and I'm not, I'm a millionaire. I'm not a billionaire. Emily's being very successful on Amazon on her way to being a millionaire. Our success will not change your success. So it doesn't matter if we're a billionaire or zero. It won't change your success. At the end of the day, you are the person you have to get up with every day and look in the mirror. And so make sure you own that, you guys. Really, really encourage you. We want to help you, but 
our sales numbers aren't going to determine your success. Now, again, no one from Just One Dime will ever be able to teach you anything unless they are successful and growing. That's important. But at the end of the day, that's not going to determine your success. It is what you do with yourself. Okay, back to the, this thing. So there is a company called Yes Theory. Has anyone ever heard of Yes Theory? And if you guys could do me a favor, I would be so honored. Please, it, guys, this is free value right here. We're taking, it'll end up probably being a little over an hour of our day to help you, okay? Whether or not you're, oh yeah, I want to join the membership. We're still doing this. I enjoy seeing you guys succeed. So if you could do me a favor, please, I'm asking you guys for something. Will you go to Instagram once they're up again? And will you follow Yes Theory for me? Follow Yes Theory. In fact, I'll type them right here. Okay, give me one second. At Yes Theory. There you go. They're a, an Instagram channel and a YouTube channel. And they have 3 million subscribers. We have, I think, 140,000. All real subscribers, by the way. They're in Venice Beach. They're right down the street, Emily. Like 20, 35 minute drive from here. We were there yesterday and it suddenly hit Kimberly. Wait a minute, Venice Beach, like they're here. We should do a video collaboration. And their theme is this, check this out. Their motto is seek discomfort. In other words, every day find something that makes you afraid and go do it every day. Seek discomfort so you can grow. Just to give you an example, they bungee jumped out of a helicopter over the Grand Canyon with Will Smith. Just to give you perspective. Now, we're much smaller if you look at YouTube statistics than they are. So for us to be able to get on their platform would be a huge honor. It gives us more value than them. <coughs> so we messaged them yesterday, and I'm trying to get them to follow me. They follow Kimberly, probably because she's pretty. <laughs> but it's fine. Uh, so we messaged them yesterday from Kimberly's account. We're like, look, we're here in Los Angeles. Let's do a video collaboration. And they responded and said, Sorry, we're too, you know, we're, we're too busy. You know, it sounds like you guys have an awesome story. And so we're like, no, 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 guys, please, please listen. Follow, let us do a video collaboration with you today. Even if it's two hours, we'll make it worth your time. And it's like, we're really busy. Our office is shut down right now. We're doing reconstruction. We're like, oh, that's cool. Our office is reconstruction too. So what we're doing is we're after this show, Emily, I'm taking my family. We're taking these 1,000 dimes. This is 1,000 dimes. And we're going to go to their doorstep. We found them, by the way. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> and we're going to spell out, seek discomfort on their doorstep just to get their attention. The whole thing is going to be live. We're going to tag them. Pray to God that their Instagram, start, Instagram starts working. <laughs> and then we'll come out and do something. This is an example. Now, I even asked one of my sons, does this make you nervous? He's like, yeah, I'm a little uncomfortable. Seek discomfort. It's a cool opportunity. What's the worst that can happen? No one does anything. Okay. But it was still a fun experience with my family. So that's what these dimes are for. It's a symbol. Look, guys, we started with a single dime. Here's a thousand dimes, and we're going to go spell it out on their doorstep and see if we can get them to respond and have it live. So, everyone, please, would you do me a favor? Will you follow Yes Theory on Instagram and message them directly and say, just one dime is showing up at your door. Please do a video collab with them. I would love to see it. If all of you guys would do this, please, this is your way of thanking me for the free content we deliver. I had a guy walk up to me. 40,000 a month. He showed me a seller central just watching the free content, not even a member yet who he made into millionaires, just the free content. So if that's enough payment, please follow this theory and message them and say, look, just when I'm is in your, they're going to be at your doorstep. Please respond to them. Do a video club. I would love to watch it. Like overwhelm them. Will everybody do this, please? A thousand times. This would like totally make my day. If you guys would do that for me. Yes. Theory on Instagram, direct message them, please. Okay, we'll keep going. <laughs> and, and Emily, we do it too. I did. I just followed them, and I'll send the message when we're done. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. All right. We're gonna take a few more questions, guys. But I want to honor Emily's time as well as mine. So we'll take a few more, but we'll do short answers, which is impossible for me to do, but we'll still do it anyways. <laughs> okay. All right. And Abdul Nasir Sheikh, I would love to meet you, sir so you can see what robots we are. Okay, Ronak, this is a great question, guys. By the way, I got to meet Ronak. Um, he is a million dollar seller. Um, he is a student of Just One Dime and he's crushing it. And he is one of the most humble, sincere guys. I don't know if you got a chance to meet him. He's from UK, okay. Yep, yep. All right, Ronak says, how do you maximize, this shows you he's an entrepreneur by the question. You can see what he's struggling with. <laughs> Excuse me. How do you maximize every minute of the day and make sure your time is being used to its full 
potential. We all need to make the most of our time. It is the one resource once spent you cannot get back. I feel like I just need to sit in silence for a minute because it's so true. Okay, number one, I'm just going to share a bunch and you share whatever you want, Emily. Number one, don't do things that someone else can do for you. Number two, cut out all distractions. And if you're still distracted by Facebook notifications, by Instagram, by direct messages, by phone calls, you need to grow up. I mean that sincerely, guys. Grow beyond that. I've had to and I'm still learning to. You've got to cut out distractions. By default, I want to do the easy, lazy thing first. Well, you need to check my email. Well, no, Seth, you need to be working on this next product launch. See what I mean? It's those things we push off. Number three, eat the frog first. Do the hardest things at the beginning of your day. Do the hardest things first. Number four, repurpose. Let me give you an example. Everything that I learn, I teach my students at some form or another. It's repurposing it. I don't want to just learn it and do it for myself. I enjoy passing it on. Now, some people say, well, if you make so much on Amazon, why do you coach? Have you ever heard of someone who actually enjoys doing something where there's not money involved? That's a real thing, people. It's a real thing in the world. There are some people still in this world who are like that. And I don't say that because I think I'm special. I love teaching and I love seeing people succeed. That was so freaking motivating to me at econ. But it is a business as well. We do make money doing it, but it is freaking hard compared to our Amazon businesses. So what I do is everything I learn, I repurpose it and I teach it. So that also is an income and it's changing lives as well, which long term, the real value is not the money. It's the networking, the opportunity I told you guys about in Los Angeles with the clothing manufacturer. If I wasn't coaching people, I wouldn't have that opportunity. That feeds right back into my Amazon businesses. See? So it's, it's, it's cycles. It, it's everything feeds everything. Um, the other thing is I only do things that I'm naturally really good at and everything else I outsource. Now, at some point in the beginning, you need to do everything just so you understand it. Otherwise, you can't train people to do it. But once you're good at that, you need to have someone else help you. Um, use software. Just so I talked about this at Ecom. Everything possible that is a redundant, ongoing, menial task, get software to do it for you. The other thing is be okay with the fact that every day there's a lot of things you won't get done. But if you did the most important things, you'll sleep well. And it's something I'm still learning, Ronak. I'm still in, in the Seth on Fire coaching which many of you guys are going to be a part of. I'm going to be sharing with you guys as I go what I am doing currently and as I change what I will be doing. Anything you want to add to that, Emily, to Ronak's great question? Yeah, on the way to Ecom on my first flight, I sat next to this um, ex-Marine. He was just 40 years old, president of a multinational firm. And he said something that reminded me of something that I believe, which is, you need to have your mind blown as frequently as possible. The kind of information where you're like, whoa, I could have never gotten there in my own brain. I never would have approached the situation or the thought or the topic or whatever. And we were swapping podcast recommendations because a lot of his um, podcasts that he listened to are ex something military. And they've right. gone on to start huge companies and on and on. But there's this synthesis that happens when you start listening to a teacher speak about something or an ex Marine or whatever it is, all of that is applicable to you and how you approach situations. And if you combine the just one dime training with seeing things completely differently based on people who are way ahead of you in topics that might not even interest you, it could be neuroscience, but it could change the way that you think. Then when you think of your product idea or you scan your environment or whatever it is, and then you combine it with training to do it on Amazon, it's, it's going to be phenomenal. And so I would say when you're brushing your teeth, be listening to something. When you're driving in your car, make every moment count so that you can be getting some good um, feedback and encouragement or whatever you need in that moment. Um, so I've, I've really started, even since I got home from Ecom just a couple days ago, started being very purposeful with what I bother listening to or kind of putting in my brain. Cause it's easy to just drive and tune out, you know, right. but being last really intentional. Last night we, yesterday for lunch, we ordered food. We were ordered takeout and I sat down as I was about to order it. And I thought, wait a minute, right now I could be working on content that's been in the back of my mind. I need to write it down. Cause that's some really neat things I want to share with everyone who's part of build your future. And so I literally, I turned, I said, hey, Ali, do you mind ordering, or it was EJ, I forget who, but one of our kids, do you mind ordering? And they love to do it. Like, yeah, no problem. So they did it. In other words, it, don't be afraid to let other people do things for you. 
Um, and some people, they love that. They want to be the kind of person who comes along and says, look, let me pick up those administrative other tasks that don't require the same level of expertise. I enjoy doing that. Some people are like that. It allows you as the business owner to focus on the main priorities. That's really, really good. When I work out and listen to podcasts, I'm educating my brain while I'm exercising my body. And at first it was really weird because I'd like to stop and like, wait, this rest has been too long. I've been so focused and I've had to learn how to do both, but it, it really works, you guys. Great question, Ronak, and thank you for asking, man. Okay, so we'll take a few more questions here. Um, I need help. I like to get some one-on-one coaching. So what you want to do, William, is in the about part of this video, and this video will be posted, everyone, so you can go back and watch it if you want, you're going to see a link to what is called Amazon FBA Mastery. And it's not just one course. It is not just two courses. It is not just three courses or four. It is five full courses showing you step-by-step -step from beginning to end how to build an Amazon business that works for you instead of you working for it. You guys, I know there's a lot of courses out there. This isn't one of those courses with a few quick tips and tricks. It's not like that. This is, shows you how to build a legal, legitimate, um, strong scaling, brand focused business. Like I have a lawyer on my team, just to give you guys perspective. I have excellent copywriters on my team. We understand the industry. And I've learned the need of hiring people smarter than me to bring them on so we can actually build something that's powerful and then pass exactly what we're learning on to other people. So and just to give you perspective, guys, on average, if you just take an average based on the numbers that I'm aware of, people who give it just two hours a day, six days a week for a year, if you can set aside that time, by the end of the year, every single warrior who I know who that did this went from either 500 a month profit all the way up some to millions. And I do not use that word lightly. Millions, you guys. Millions a month. I don't do millions a month. I'm in the hundreds of thousands, not in the millions on Amazon. So just to give you perspective, yeah, you're, the investment is worth it. Find a way, join, and hustle, and we'll do everything we can to help you get there. All right, Daria says, can we do giveaways not on Amazon, on Instagram, for example? You absolutely can do them on Amazon. Just use their giveaway page under the promotions tab, as I mentioned earlier, Daria. And the on Instagram, yes, you can do giveaways there. What I recommend is you do Facebook and Instagram because they're owned by the same company. You run a promotion as a giveaway and give them some kind of discount up to 40%, between 10 and 40 is ideal. And then they buy your product. There's a gift in the product. By the way, guys, Amazon doesn't, I saw this other question. Amazon doesn't ship the gift separately. It's in the box already. You made sure the manufacturer put it in there, or if you had it shipped to your house before you sent it to Amazon's fulfillment center, you had that done as well. And when they open the box, they get it. You don't have to put the gift in all of your products. You could just say, look, I'm going to do it in my first batch of 350 or 100 even. And, and because let's just say you send in 500 and only half of them have the gift, that's fine. You didn't promise them it anyways. See what I mean? But if you're going to do a follow-up email that refers to the gift, make sure that entire batch has those gifts in it when you launch because that will increase your review rate like crazy. All right, what is the, okay, I'm gonna give this one to you, Emily. Um, anything you wanna share, and if you don't know, that's totally fine. What is the cost for design patent research with a patent lawyer? I have a similarly designed product to another seller, but have improved and modified a design. By the way, good job. Whoever resolved future gaming, that's a funny name your parents gave you. No, I'm joking. <laughs> but seriously, really good job. I love how you're thinking. This person right here is thinking like an entrepreneur. I love it. You looked at the competition, you understand, and you improved on it. And I'm assuming you did that because that's what your future customers want. So back to the question, Emily. What is the cost for design patent research with a patent lawyer? And this person's worried about patent infringement, they say. Yeah, I don't want to quote any kind of number because it's obviously going to be widely different from law firm to law firm. I would call around until you get a great price. And I know for me, this was meeting with an accountant, so I realize it's different. But when I went in and I actually sat down with someone locally, I got a much different rate than when I made a phone call because he saw that I was passionate and I was an entrepreneur and I was a mom and I was a startup and all these things. And so there was that personal relationship. So it was actually really advantageous for me not to call California to find an accountant in this case. And I think the same is true a lot of times of our lawyers and different services um, that we provide. And another, this is not a tip for this particular case because you need 
solid expertise, but just along the way, as you're putting your research together to see if you're infringing and as you design new products or continue to design this product, use local resources like a law school. You can access um, professors that love to give help for free because they're passionate about the topic and they're dying to do something in the marketplace, not just conceptually within a classroom. Um, there's a lot of uh, law um, organizations that gather locally in different cities that you're invited to go and sit in on a meeting and get some free expertise. And I'm not suggesting you do this when it comes down to you know, determining if there's infringement. I'm just saying during the process, these can be tools to help you get the answer in a, in a little bit less expensive way until you have that meeting with an actual lawyer. Yeah, excellent. Do your research, guys. Every lawyer is going to have different fees. Excellent question. And thank you, Emily. <clears throat> what do you say about the inventory, which is seasonal? Should I keep it in FBA or take it back and resend later? I'm talking about winter wear clothing. I would definitely do a removal order, a meet, do a removal order, have it sent back to you until it's ready to send to ship, until it's back in season again. Otherwise, you're going to spend a lot of money on storage fees, especially once you hit the six and 12 month marks. Uh, Sonia says, how do I create an ad group campaign? So Sonia, you just follow through the steps. If you're in the membership, we show you step-by-step step, sharing our screen exactly where to clip. The ad group campaign is simple. You're just creating a campaign. You just follow the steps. Name it something that's relevant to your strategy. Use the strategy I recommend that we teach in the training. And then for optimizing the manual broad campaign, I'm going to refer you back to the earlier part of this video. Watch it. I do go in depth on that on how to optimize. And you can watch that. And then if you have other questions, next Wednesday we'll be back here. We can answer them for you. Um, let's see, it was me, I put 12 back and they suppressed my listing. I'm not sure about that question until you have to expound. Uh, which software can I use to check all seasonal products? Google Trends is one of my favorites. Uh, Amazeal gives you a lot of that data as well. And then doing the market research like Emily mentioned earlier. How do I include a gift if Amazon is fulfilling? As I mentioned, you have your supplier put it in the package, the retail packaging before they ship it in, or you do it yourself. But it's already in the box with the product when it gets to Amazon's fulfillment center. What are your thoughts on having someone with the vendor account add A plus content on one of your listings? I see this on Fiverr and I'm so tempted it seems really sketchy. So first of all, the fact that the, your question tells me, Jessica, you know a lot, which is awesome. That is how they're able to add a video if you don't have, if you're not brain registered yet. Um, they do it through a vendor account. It is risky. I wouldn't do it. And the reason why is I kid you not, Emily, when I was at the manufacturer, the clothing manufacturer here in LA, one of the guys they hired on the team was doing 1.2 million on Amazon. I'll tell you exactly how he did it. And he doesn't mind because his listing is completely, his account is gone. He would buy blenders at Costco and resell them. That's it, reseller. He was doing 1.2 million a year on that. I don't know his profit margins, but I'm sure they were enough to make it worth it to him to spend all that time. Well. Somehow, and again, I don't know if he did something on Fiverr, someone got access to his account through Vendor Central. I've never sold on Vendor Central, so I'm not confident speaking about it, but I can tell you exactly what Amazon told me when I was at the conference. There have been leaks, and so if someone gets to your account through Vendor Central, if the wrong person gets access to it, I mean, they completely took over his listings, they sold different products, I mean, everything, and Amazon thought he was the bad guy in the end, he lost everything. So be careful with that. I'm not trying to scare you from better. I have the product manufactured. I list it on Amazon and either I or Amazon fulfills it. I am the manufacturer and I'm selling and I'm paying Amazon a referral fee to sell in their system and I'm paying them for fulfillment fees to fulfill it. Vendor central is different. Vendor means I get it manufactured, but I sell it to Amazon. Amazon buys it from me and they control the pricing. So a vendor central account includes A plus listings, which is kind of comparable to a seller central account that's brand registered includes enhanced brand content. So A plus, I'm being confusing. Here's vendor, here's seller central, okay? Most of you guys are seller central. You call it a third party. Vendor central is called a first party. First party has A plus, vendor seller central has enhanced brand content. And it's really easy to know the difference because if it says about this manufacturer in bold right before it goes into that beautiful description, that is vendor. Okay. But if it does not say about the just his product description, then that is enhanced brand. In other words, seller central, just to get, give you guys perspective. I don't want to do vendor central. I don't think I ever will, 
In fact, they closed off applications for it and you can only be invited now. So anyways, probably more data than you guys were looking for, but just to give you perspective, to answer your question, I wouldn't recommend it, Jessica, based on what I've heard. Uh, Michael, you are correct. Keepa did disable the sales rank in the message they sent me is that Amazon's algorithm keeps changing and so they have to update to get it working again. Last I checked, Amazal's still working on that. They're still working for that. Okay, guys, great questions. I wish I could answer all your questions. Um, Don, thank you so much for the comment. I've been in marketing for 19 years, been doing paid just as long. I've listened to a lot of Amazon selling clowns and I have to say these guys are the best. Thank you so much. That is awesome and I'm so glad to hear this is helping you guys. So Don, to answer your question at the end, you get a video in your product description by getting brand registered. You get brand registered by getting your trademark approved. You get trademark approved by applying at USPTO.gov and that can take eight to more than 12 months depending on the category and how busy USPTO.gov is at the time. The more arbitrary the name is, the faster you can get it approved, the less likely someone's gonna make a claim against it when it's put in the official Gazette paper, which gives people a chance to contest, wait a minute, that's similar to mine. Okay, guys, I hope that's helpful. You guys, have an awesome rest of your day. Again, for those of you guys who are not part of Just One Dime, only if you are dead serious about this, join us. We'll help you. We will do everything we can. We will bust our butts to help you crush it on Amazon. There's a link below. For those of you guys who saw these dimes, a thousand of them, please, guys, do me a favor. It's simple. Follow Yes Theory and direct message them and say, hey, just when Dime wants to collaborate with you, please open the door to them. Will you guys do that for me? I think it's good. they're going to be mindful like, wait a minute, maybe we should take these guys seriously. And then they open their door and it says, seek discomfort in Dime's on their doorstep. I can't wait. And I will, if Instagram's working, I'll do it live so you guys can watch it. Emily, give everyone one reason, one reason they should be part of Just One Dime. Because you're a student of Just One Dime, you also now are helping others to succeed. Give them one reason and then we'll go. So I went to business school and the Just One Dime course taught way beyond business school. There's a lot of classes you take where you're like, check, check, I know this, I know this. Everything I learned, I mean, this course content has blown up. You've done such a good job at adding to it and making everything clear. And I've gone back and watched videos like four, five, six times to make sure I'm super clear on stuff. And it has changed everything. I mean, the last eight months for me, re-watching that stuff has brought me to a whole nother level. And you guys get to start there. You don't get to start eight months ago or a year ago. You get to start right now with five different courses. That's unbelievable. So I would encourage you, no sales pitch, no gimmicks, no you know incentives on my end, just genuine, genuine, genuinely from my heart, I would say, join if you want to be successful. It's the seriously the best way to go. And guys, we will always be honest with you. We won't pretend like, oh, it's just as simple as do two or three little things and you're in. It isn't. We're going to be honest with you. It's going to be hard. But here's my question. Would you rather have, you know, being broke is hard and being wealthy is hard. Which hard do you want? <laughs> you know, like which one do you prefer? I feel better today at 41 than I did when I was 21. I eat healthier because I can afford it. I exercise more consistently because I feel motivated about my life and I'm just happier in my relationships. It's not because of the money. The money helps is because I had to change to get to this point. And my friends, if there's anything that will change for you, it's not so much about the tactics on Amazon, although as Emily said, we'll show you. It, it's huge. You will change from the inside out if you're willing to be teachable and humble and say, I'm in, I'm doing this, I want to change my life. So they have margin to do the things I love with the people I love. That is our mission, guys. And, and I'm still, Emily, my mind still doesn't get totally comprehended. We've turned several people into millionaires. They did the work, but we taught them. Do you know what an honor that is, you guys? I hope that encourages you that, man, my goodness, even just get to 500 a month. Think about how much that is in a year. Like, and then you can just keep scaling and scaling and going and going and going. Anyways, awesome. Emily, thank you so much for your time today. Have an awesome day, everybody. Bye, guys. Bye, everybody.